Okay, we want to talk today about, uh, I'm not really sure what to call this message, milk versus meat or milk and meat. or. Uh, but basically what I want to cover today is that you're to be established with milk and not with meat. Okay, meat is fine, milk is fine, but you're not to be established on meat. You're supposed to be established on the milk. So we're going to start out in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. This is going to be very good instruction in righteousness for any dispensation. A lot of people are very guilty of violating this verse. We're going to talk about that as we continue. Okay, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. It says here, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. There are some people that try to be established. They make their main thing, their main stands, they make it about meat. Strong spiritual meat. Or strong scriptural meat. We're going to look at that today. And they try to make you know some really difficult teaching their main core doctrine. Not a good idea. You have to go back to milk. And we're going to look at that today. All right. Uh, turn to First Corinthians chapter three. First Corinthians chapter three, verse one. We're going to look at the most carnal church in the Bible here in the New Testament. I should say, the most carnal group of Christians back there in the first century was the group or the uh, Corinthian believers. That's why the two biggest books are written to the Corinthians. They had a lot of problems. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? You know why there's divisions among a lot of believers? Because they try to establish their lives with meat and not with milk. They get into all these really difficult things like I was saying about these really complex systems like Calvinism or things like that. And they try to establish themselves with that. And then there's divisions among the brethren as a result. Same thing is going on there in Corinth. Exact same thing. And see, one of the problems is people see there that milk is associated with babies. And they say, I don't want to be a baby. I want to be a big Christian. <laughs> you know. Well, you have to start out as a baby. All right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's not an insult to be called a babe in Christ. All right? If you get saved, I don't care. You could be 50, 60 years old. But if you get saved, you're a babe in Christ. And you need to be established in milk first before you can handle meat. All right? That's just the way it is. And it's true in both the spiritual realm and in the physical. Okay? You know, right here we have our, you know, the youngest member of our church right there. She's how old? Four months. Four months old. Okay? Four months old. Is she ready for meat? No. You know, she needs milk. Milk or uh, meat would not be a good idea to give her right now. It'd be a very bad idea. And a brand new babe in Christ, don't feed them meat. Okay, they're going to choke. <laughs> they're going to be in big trouble. Okay, and even when you get saved and you've been saved for a long time and you can start to handle some of the meat, you still need milk to wash it down. Okay, you can't have meat without milk. Okay, you can actually have milk without meat, but you can't have meat without milk. It's important to remember. So, now what about milk? We're going to go back to the very first time it appears. Genesis chapter 18 Verse 1. I just want to try to prove a point here. Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. I'm going to kick something else here while I'm at it in this sermon. Okay, Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him, 
And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. It's kind of interesting because real bread is good for your heart. The Bible is very scientific. Continuing here, after that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. It was baked. Okay. Um, or maybe you could say fried there too. I'm not sure exactly. But uh, verse 7. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk. It's the very first time it appears in the Bible. And the calf which he had dressed and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. So you have four different things there for their little meal that they had. They had bread, they had butter, they had beef, and they had milk. Okay? Now, I'm going to kick something here real quick. Was the milk pasteurized? <laughs> no. Was it homogenized or neutralized or desensitized or anything else that they do nowadays? <laughs> no. Right now, the federal government here in America is telling people that you cannot drink milk right from a cow. And they're actually sending federal agents around and raiding Amish farmers who are trying to sell whole milk. It's insanity. It's just totally crazy. And there are activist groups that are fighting for the right to drink raw milk. That's how insane our world has become. Where a government actually steps in and says, you're not allowed to drink milk from a cow. What did people do for thousands of years? They drank milk right from cows. Yeah. It's crazy. See? And there's a reason that they don't want you drinking milk right from a cow. Because it's very healthy. And see, they put it through their factories and they take all the helpful bacteria out and, and everything else. And there's a big study on that. And actually, we're going to be having some information on that. The Bible and health messages. There's going to be one that covers a lot of the dairy issues. And you're going to see that natural whole milk is very good for you. Right? And that's what the Bible's talking about. This chemical stuff that comes out of factories is not good for you. Okay? Just wanted to kick that. I mean, I was raised on raw milk. I never knew store milk. And the first time I ever tasted store milk, it was like, ugh, you know, I couldn't even drink it. You know, I still have a hard time drinking. I still can't drink, you know, the store-bought milk. I still drink it for, uh, raw you know, oh, I guess I'm a criminal now because I drink raw milk. It's insane. Turn to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. We're going to see an interesting prophecy here. Genesis chapter 49. We're going to see about Jacob here. And God called Jacob, who... Does anybody know what God called Jacob? What was his name from God? Israel. God called Jacob Israel. Okay, he was the father, and he had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what they turned into. And here he gives a prophecy. Look at verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together, and hear ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. So there you have his name given. Now jump down to verse 8. It says here, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Binding his foal 
unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. Did you know that milk has calcium in it? It's good for your teeth, builds strong bones, good for your dental health. You say, oh, the Bible's not scientific. Yes, it is. The Bible's not only a book of prophecy, a book of history, a book about salvation, a book about the sins of men, but it contains science all the way through it. Okay? And right there, by the way, verses 9 down through 12 is actually a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, what are you talking about there? It's talking about a lion. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5 says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And if you heard the study about Satan, Satan appears, it says about he's a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. See, everything that Jesus Christ is, Satan counterfeits. Okay? And the full manifestation of that's going to be the Antichrist coming in the future. He's going to be an Antichrist, against Christ, but also a counterfeit. But it's interesting there, the thing about <clears throat> his teeth white with milk. Now, most other references to milk in your Old Testament it's talking about the promised land that God has for the Jews. And it says it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, that would mean that the land is very fertile. Okay, Why? Well, because cows need grass to produce milk. So it would be a very good land to move to, a land that flows with milk and honey. Now we're going to go to a book you don't often preach from, Song of Solomon. <clears throat> we're going to see another thing about milk here. The book of Song of Solomon. This is a book that oftentimes I think is a is best as a you know just to read it in private study. It's meant to show the love between a king and his uh, bride, basically. But there's something interesting here I want to show you in uh, Song of Solomon here, chapter five, verse ten. Here the bride is basically writing to, uh, <clears throat> writing about, she's describing her husband, the king. And again, this is a type of Jesus Christ, Okay, what you're reading here. Uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 10. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousand. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. So there you see another very interesting uh, reference to milk. Just thought that was kind of unique. First uh, Peter chapter two verse two. Now, this is a very important one here. I'm going to tie the thing in the Song of Solomon together with this here in just a minute. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. And this verse is attacked in almost all of the new versions. They change it. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. It says here, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Okay? Now, a lot of your new versions are going to say, uh, crave pure spiritual milk or desire um, milk or something like that, and they leave out of the Word. Very interesting why they would do that. So your Bible is likened to sincere milk. Very interesting. Turn back to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. Remember what we read back there in the Song of Solomon about that his eyes are white like milk? And there it said, desire the sincere milk of the word. Well, look at this. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. 
But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Kind of interesting because if the sincere milk of the word is within you, it'll come out and you'll be able to see things with spiritual eyesight. Why? Well, because whatever you run into in life, you're going to judge it by the word of God. Just an interesting little tie in there. Now you say, well, you know, definitely it looks like milk is the thing to have in. So I guess meat is bad, right? No, it isn't. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. You do need to have both. You can't just get to a point where all you have is milk. You have to grow up sometime as a Christian and start eating a little bit of meat. But you can't eat just meat either. And that's where a lot of people get messed up. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. It says here, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, as I stated earlier, a lot of people will read verse 13 and they say, Oh no, it's an, if you use milk, you're unskillful in the word, you're a babe. You know, and they say, I don't want to be like that. I want to be, you know, a meat eating Christian. But it doesn't say that you can't have milk and you shouldn't have milk. You know, that's not what it's saying there. Verse 12 says, you know, these guys are trying to be teachers. You have need, need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. When you start getting messed up in meat, you need to be taught the first principles, the first oracles of God. There, the first, the basics of the Bible, the basics of what it means to be a Christian. You need to go back to the milk. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to encounter teachings that people are going to say, and we're going to be hitting these coming up next here. You're going to be encountering a lot of teachings and things out there, and it's going to be very strong meat, but the way you decipher it is not just looking at it just with meat. You need to go back to the milk. You need to return to the first principles of the oracles of God. The basics of your faith is what you need to go back to. So, having said that, let's go back and drink some milk. Some spiritual milk. As we talked about there in 1 Peter 2 too. Hymn number 708 in our hymnal. We're not going to turn there. But uh, it's Jesus loves me, this I know. It's a kid's song. People go, ah, oh, it's a kid's song. It's for babies. You know, I'm not going to sing that. You ought to sing it. There's some good words in it. Now, the first part of it says, Jesus loves me, this I know. All right? And of course, it goes on from there. We're going to be going through the whole, you know, first verse there. But, Jesus loves me, this I know. Turn to John chapter 3, verse 16. We're going to look at the basics of salvation, the basics of your Christian faith. This is probably the most memorized verse in the entire Bible. <coughs> and uh, what happens a lot of times is people memorize an easy verse like this and they just rip through it and they don't really think about what's being said. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay? When does everlasting life begin? Does it begin at death? No. Read the verse. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life comes at salvation. Alright? It doesn't come after it. You don't have to endure to the end to be saved right now in this dispensation. That will be true in the tribulation, but not for today. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 Romans chapter 8, verse 35. We're going to look at another thing here about Jesus loves me, this I know. Romans chapter 
Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? What's going to separate you from the love of Christ? Nothing. So when somebody comes along and they try to get you into strong meat that teaches that you can lose your salvation, that you have to endure to the end, and you have to work hard, and if you fall away it's impossible again to renew you to repentance and all this stuff, taking verses completely out of context, crossing dispensational lines to prove that you can lose your salvation, just say, no, no, I remember the song. Jesus loves me, this I know. Go back to the milk. Somebody presents you with strong meat. You don't fight it with strong meat, necessarily. You just go, all you have to do is just step back to the milk and say, wait a second, Jesus loves me. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. He loves me. I don't have to worry about it now. I know I'm saved, according to 1 John uh, chapter 5, verse 13. I'm saved. I got eternal life at salvation. I don't need to be deceived by somebody who tells me I can lose it. Jesus loves me one minute, and then he hates me the next minute, and then he loves me again because I can get resaved, and then he hates me again because I sin, and then loves and then hate, and then love and then hate. That's nonsense. Not true. Now, what about the next part of Jesus loves me? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Hmm. John chapter 17, verse 17. You don't have to turn there because it's right there on the front of the pulpit. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Simple. Well, you know, I don't know. I think uh, uh, all no translation is inspired. I mean, you know, can you really say that the Bible's true? I mean, the Bible has some good stuff, but it contains a few errors. Not according to that verse right there. Thy word is truth. If it has errors, it can't be truth. An error is a lie. It's a contradiction. It can't be true. So you can't take this verse and then throw out other verses in the Bible. Either the whole Bible's perfect or none of it's perfect. See? It just doesn't work. Romans chapter 3. While we're there in the book of Romans, turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 3. It says here, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written. Notice that. <clears throat> let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written. Hmm. That thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Isn't that interesting? When the lost world judges you, when they say that you're a nut, because you believe in the Bible, just say, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. Well, I don't believe the Bible. I believe the Bible has errors in it. You're a liar. God said, thy word is truth. I know that the word of God is true. Sorry. Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so. I don't have to worry about certain parts of the Bible being wrong. If you're using the King James Bible, by the way. Okay? <clears throat> So somebody comes along to you and they tell you that the Bible has errors in it and you know it's, there's no such thing as a perfect Bible. See, that's, that's my big problem with these new versions. It isn't that they come and they say the King James is wrong and our new version is perfect. They're not saying that. They're coming along and they're saying the King James is wrong, the new versions that we use are wrong, the Greek texts are wrong, everything's wrong, there is no perfect Bible. That's how you know it's not of the Lord. Okay? That strong meat that they bring where they talk to you about readings in the Greek and Alexandrinus and, and Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and, and they go into all this complicated stuff. Don't try to stick to it with meat. Okay, there's a lot that you have to know to be able to, to battle these Alexandrian people. Just step back to the milk. The Bible tells me so. I know I'm saved. I know Jesus loves me. Why? Well, the Bible tells me so. You don't need to fight them with meat. Just step back to the milk. Don't let anybody steal your Bible from you. There's a lot of that out there today. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. Hmm. Romans chapter 8. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Okay, what is our relationship to the Lord as Christians? It says here, Romans 8, 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You are a child of God if you are saved, if you are a Christian. Okay? And you will reign with Jesus Christ as a joint heir, as a brother, basically. You know, little brother. <laughs> uh, but you'll reign with him if you suffer with him. And, it, you know, you don't have to physically make yourself suffer, you know, like these Catholics try to do. They whip themselves and they wear a uh, hair shirt and all this other weird stuff. That's not the sufferings it's talking about. You just live for Jesus Christ, the sufferings will come. Okay? Your family will turn against you. People will call you crazy. You'll suffer. Okay? Just for living for Jesus Christ. But my point I'm trying to make here is you are a child of God. Can you be unborn once, once you're born into a family? No. You can change your name. You can change your address. You can change all kinds of stuff. But the point is you are still a member of whatever family you were born into, whether you like it or not. And that's the way it is with the Lord. When you get saved, you're one of His children. You say, well, what if I don't want to be one of His children? Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. <clears throat> Okay, and again here you're going to see this, uh, here it crosses dispensational lines. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh, which speaketh unto you as unto children, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Okay, the Bible word there, bastard, basically means somebody who does not know their father. And there's a lot of people that are like that. They claim to be Christians, they claim to be saved, and they don't know their father. You'll, see, you'll hear them, they'll say, you know, I don't believe in the God of the Old Testament. You know, I just can't relate to that God of the Old Testament. Well, that's probably because he's not your father. Okay? I don't have a problem with the God of the Old Testament. I understood what he was doing. A lot of those nations were perverts. They were doing some very disgusting, horrible things. And that's why he was telling the Israelites, go on in there and kill all of them. You know? You don't like that? Well, you don't know him as your father. You don't question what your father does. You accept it. Okay, verse 8. But if ye be without ch chastisement, whereof all are partakers. It doesn't matter what dispensation you live in. If you are a son, if you're a child of God, you will be a partaker of God's chastening. Okay, it's right there. Uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 12. Now, you're a child of God, and He will chasten you when you are bad. But uh, is that where... Well, we're going to see something else here. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. There's your salvation. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Now, we've covered this in other studies, but 
Acts chapter 20, verse 28 talks about God purchasing you with His own blood. Okay, ye are bought with a price. It says there back in, in the book of Corinthians. When you get saved, God actually buys you. He purchases you. And a lot of people don't think about this, but this is another verse that proves a pre-tribulation rapture. When is the redemption of the purchased possession? Well, it happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. That's when God says, okay, those my children that are down there, before I pour out my wrath on the lost world that has rejected me, I'm going to remove my children. What kind of a father would he be if he just poured out all of his wrath and his hatred on his own children? Doesn't make sense. Okay? You say, well, he, you know, you endure chastening. Chastening, yeah, but not the wrath of God. We're not appointed to God's wrath. Okay? So, don't let anybody deceive you into believing that God is going to pour out his wrath on his own children. And by the way, it says there you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? You're sealed. Back in Ephesians 4.30, it talks about sealed unto the day of redemption. In the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble that's coming, people can lose their salvation if they take the mark of the beast. That's why they have to endure to the end. You have to rightly divide the word of truth in these areas. Okay? Post-tribulation rapture teaching is a lie from Satan. I can tell you that. It'll mess you up in a lot of different doctrines. Now, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. What's the next part? They are weak. But he is strong. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. Turn over there. Philippians 4 13. Now this is one of the most important verses in your New Testament. And again, because it's important, the new versions attack it. They'll remove the word Christ. It says here, Philippians 4 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Remember what it said there in the song? They are weak, but he is strong. Where does your strength come from as a Christian? It comes from Jesus Christ. Right there it says it. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Turn back a few books towards the front of your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 9. Second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 says, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. They are weak, but he is strong. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now what is the meat, the corrupt meat that comes along today that tries to get people messed up? Well, the prosperity gospel. The charismatic prosperity gospel that teaches that you should be in perfect health and you should be wealthy and own a big house and a nice car and everything else. That's not what the Bible teaches. Totally contrary to the teachings of the New Testament. You study the life of Paul, he had it rough. And why? Well, because in his weakness he had strength. He could relate to people. People could relate to him. If you're a multi-millionaire Christian and you've never been sick in your life, you're not going to relate to too many people. Okay? It's going to be a problem. And by the way, you can't become a multi-millionaire in this world unless you cut some corners. Okay? There are very few real, true, sold-out Christians that ever make it up into the millions of dollars. Okay? Most of them are sold out, but it's to the world, not to the Lord. So watch out for that prosperity gospel thing. Okay? Going back to the song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. The Bible tells me so. Not my feelings tell me so doesn't go that way. My pastor tells me so. My priest tells me no. <laughs> Sorry, the Bible. The Bible is to be your standard. Okay? That's the basics. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. It's right there. 
Well, yes, but, you know, recent scholarship is found, and, you know, let me quote here from the Nestle's 27th edition here, the Greek word, just be quiet. I don't even want to talk to you. I believe the King James Bible. If you don't believe it, that's fine. That's your right. That's your privilege. But don't cram it down my throat. Don't tell me that the Bible's not true. All right? You don't know what you're talking about. Now, just to kind of cover a few things here before we continue, as a Christian, number one, you are saved and sealed. You have eternal security. Okay? Not of works, by the way, but by faith. That's the thing. When you start to doubt your eternal security, you'll believe that you're justified by works and not by faith. It's a problem. Number two, you have a final written authority. You have a perfect Bible, if you're using the King James Bible and you're English speaking. Number three, you are a child of God. You will be spared from God's wrath through the rapture. The redemption of the purchased possession comes before the time of Jacob's trouble. Plain teaching of Scripture. People say, oh, you can't prove it from the Bible. You can absolutely prove it. Don't believe these post-trib rapture thieves. They're just liars. Number four, you have strength through Jesus Christ. You're going to have trials and tribulation, and that's the key to reigning with Jesus Christ. Your suffering that you go through in this life is how you will be reigning and ruling with Jesus Christ. Those sufferings will lead to rewards. You suffer for Jesus, and you're doing right. And these charismatics, this prosperity gospel that tries to take away suffering, they're actually trying to take away your rewards, your millennial inheritance. Don't fall for it. Now how about another milk song for children? <clears throat> hymn number 710 in our hymnal, Jesus Loves the Little Children. Now here's the chorus. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Now, Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. We'll see the scriptural thing here, how that lines up with the Bible. Galatians 3.22 Is it true that Jesus loves the little children of the world and all the different races, no matter what color your skin is? Is that true? Well, let's look here. Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. Okay. Uh, but the Scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Or in Christ Jesus. Don't let anybody try to take you back under the Ten Commandments, by the way, and tell you that you're justified by keeping the commandments. That's a lie. Total lie. And a lot of these Messianic Jew people try to do that. They try to take you away from the faith of Jesus Christ. They'll use words like Yahushua, which is Joshua in Hebrew. They'll say, I'm saved by Yahushua. That's Joshua. Joshua didn't die on the cross. Jesus did. Okay, don't fall for that heretical nonsense either but the point is as they continue they will take you away from faith being justified by faith and they'll try to get you back under the law total heresy satanic heresy but what about the thing of jesus dying you know for more than one race verse 27 for as many of you as have been baptized into christ have put on christ there is neither jew nor greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, God promised some things to Abraham and to his seed. I don't have time to get into all that. But the point is, you are born into that. You can be a black African. You can be a red Indian. You can be a, a yellow, they say yellow, Chinese or Japanese or whatever. You can be any race out there, a white European like most of us here today, you can be any race. And to the Lord, He sees you as His child. He doesn't care about the color of your skin. Okay, You are a Christian. And the Bible even says there's no distinction in God's sight between male and female, between bond or free. You could have somebody who's a slave, and if they're saved, God says they're a Christian. 
So there again, don't fall for this thing of, you know, I'm a Messianic Jew. No, you're a Christian if you're saved. Well, I'm a black African, you know, saved black African. No, you're a Christian. Well, I'm a white Aryan. No, you're not. You're a Christian if you're saved. And if you're going around saying you're an Aryan, you're probably not saved. <laughs> but the point is, if you, it doesn't matter what color your skin is. Okay, it doesn't matter what your race is or whatever. If you're saved, you are a Christian. You are justified by faith, not by the Ten Commandments. Okay, so don't fall for this thing of this racial distinctions and Messianic Judaism and, and the Hebrew Roots Movement and all that other garbage. Don't fall for it. Okay, that's meat. That's poisonous. And all you have to do, you don't have to fight it with other meat. Just step back to the milk. Say, Jesus loves the, the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Okay, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Turn back towards the front of your Bible. Romans 10, verse 9. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says here that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, did anybody see the word elect in verses 9 through 13? Whosoever of the elect. I didn't see it. But see, Calvinism, they'll put those words in there. Not literally, but they put them in in their minds. They say, well, the whosoever there is the elect. Whosoever of the elect. Whosoever the, of the people that God chose you know, without any free will of their own. That's what they say. That is heresy. Okay? Don't tell me that Jesus Christ didn't die for everybody. Jesus Christ died, and the thing that sends people to hell is their own free will rejecting Jesus Christ. I mean, it's, it, Calvinism is such an absurd teaching, and we're going to have some material coming out on that here soon, too. We're going to have a detailed study on the subject of Calvinism. It's just absurd. It's ridiculous. It's not what the Bible teaches. Okay? It doesn't matter what race you are. God will accept you and He will call you a Christian. And it doesn't matter whosoever will may come. Okay? Anybody can come and be saved. Do not fall for Calvinism. Somebody comes along and they try to get you messed up in five-point Calvinism, hyper-Calvinism, regular Calvinism. Mean, there's, there's all these little sects of Calvinism. It's all heretical. I don't believe in any of it. Okay? It's just, it's ridiculous. <coughs> now, uh, one of the, the verses there of the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children, says, I am coming, Lord, to thee, and thy soldier I will be. For he loves the little children of the world, and his cross I'll always bear, and for him I'll do and dare. For he loves the little children of the world. Okay? A soldier talks about there. Now, turn to 1 John chapter 2. Just a couple more places to turn to here and then we're done for today. 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to show you another thing that people are going to try to mess you up on. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Okay, it says here, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, remember that from earlier? We are God's children. Little children, it is last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest 
that they were not all of us. Okay, watch out for these people, these false brethren. Paul talked about in perils among false brethren. There are a lot of them out there today. Okay, but watch out for the, the thing of the world. Be careful about the world. James chapter 4, verse 4. Turn back towards the front of your Bible, just a few books. First John there, and then you have Second Peter that you go through, and then First Peter, and then James. James chapter 4 and verse 4. And I hammer these verses a lot, and I'm going to hammer them one more time because they're very good. James chapter 4, verse 4. It says here, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. It doesn't say is is the you know this God kind of disagrees with them and maybe isn't right really for where they're staying. No, it says that they're the enemy of God, and that's just a very basic milk type of a thing. How does this Christian celebrity that you're talking about or people are into? How are they viewed by the lost world? If the lost world respects them, they're the enemy of God. They're a false brother. Okay, this this big band Third Day they're called. They had a whole article in our local paper, and they were talking about how that they've their albums have gone platinum, and that their albums are played mostly on secular stations. You know what they are? They're the enemy of God. You say, well, now, oh, come on, they're they're good Christians. They're they're a good Christian band. No, they're not. And in that article, they were not giving Jesus Christ the praise or the glory. The guy was saying about the lead singer of Pearl Jam, and how that, you know, I owe him a lot because of the, his style of voice is very similar to mine, and so I saw that I was able to use my style of voice to become popular. That's the enemy of Jesus Christ. That's not a saved man doing that. Yeah, it's about money. Love of money is the root of all evil. And these guys, they come out and they say, hmm, let's see, what, what market hasn't really been, you know, milked yet for money? <laughs> You know, I can get some money from this thing if I go out and I, I, you know, do crossover albums. I'll sing to the lost end of the quote-unquote saved. See, they're about money. That's all those guys are interested in. If they were truly about serving Jesus Christ, they'd be hated by the world. All right? The secular stations wouldn't be playing their, their music. Romans chapter 12 Romans chapter 12. I'm going to show you two very important verses, and this is where we're going to end it this morning. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I put emphasis on the on the term there on the word holy because the Bible says be holy as I am holy. That's a command. Okay, holiness. And they say, are you holier than thou? Well, if the thou is a lost person, then yes. <laughs> you know. So what? Sorry about that. I'm not going to go out drinking and fornicating and doing drugs and using profanity. I am holier than the lost world. I'm supposed to be. And yet the lost the the well I should say the lost Christian world. The modern apostate Christian world, they actually will make fun of a Bible-believing Christian. They'll say, oh, you're holier than thou. You know why? Because they're worldly. They want to fit in with the world. They don't want to present their bodies a living sacrifice. That's why they don't want to talk about repentance in terms of salvation. They just want to believe and receive. Pray the magic prayer and you get in. And it doesn't. there's no change in your life. No, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. But look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, what was the point about this? Well, beware of worldly Christians. You're to be a soldier. I am coming, Lord, to thee, and thy soldier I will be, for he loves the little children of the world. And his cross I'll always bear, and for him I'll do and dare. For he loves the little children of the world. You say, oh, you know, it's a little kid's song. I don't want to talk about a little kid's song. Jesus loves the little children. Look at those lyrics. Those lyrics are strong. They're powerful. These modern day music 
he sings, I believe I can fly, and we've come to worship, and all this, uh, I get on my knees, and all these popular modern songs, they are lyrics, the lyrics are dead. They're nothing. They don't even mention Jesus Christ. And you don't see the, the aspect of the soldier. You don't see the thing of suffering for Jesus. You just don't see it. So watch out for worldly Christians. Somebody comes along and they tell you, well, I have this really amazing doctrine here and I can, you can really be popular in the world. You say, whoa, hold on a second. I remember the milk, the sincere milk of the word, the, the pure uh, precepts there, the things that I've been established in early on in my Christian life. And that is that I'm not to be a friend of the world. So any movement that goes contrary to that is not of God. Yeah, but I can show you the argument. I don't want to hear your argument. Okay? Don't try to give me meat, you know, some kind of corrupt meat, possum or horse meat or something. You know, no thank you. You know, oh, but it's really good. I don't care. I don't want it. Because, you see, I have been settled on the pure spiritual milk of the Word. And a lot of Christians get messed up because they start to eat that meat, that corrupt meat, and they try to be established on the meat, and they forget about the milk, and they start to choke on it. Now, just in conclusion here, I want to go over the, the six things that I covered there. Satan's six traps that he uses to deceive Christians. First of all, he'll try to get you away from eternal security. He'll say there's no eternal security for a Christian. So then you try to, you try to justify yourself by works. Works salvation. You go back under that. Number two, he'll try to say that there's no perfect Bible. It's not the Bible tells me so anymore. Oh no, it's just my feelings tell me so or the most recent textual scholarship has told me so. Nonsense. God has a perfect book. Okay? King James Bible. And you say, what about foreign translations? Do the foreign translations line up with what's in the King James Bible? Well, if they do... And there's many that predate the King James Bible, and the King James Bible lines up with them. Did you know that the translators actually compared, they say about it in the, in the introduction, they compared the King James Bible before they put it to press, they compared it to divers' translations they talk about? See, the King James Bible is not based 100% on Greek and Hebrew. They also compared it to other translations into foreign languages, like French and and Latin, and Spanish, and German, and whatever else. Okay? This, you know, I don't teach that the King James Bible is the only perfect Bible, and all other translations are, are evil, as far as in other foreign languages. I don't teach that. But, compare the foreign language translations to the King James Bible. If they line up with it, if the King James Bible lines up with them, great. You know, then it's a good Bible, then you can use it. But, be careful of that when somebody tries to take you away from a perfect Bible, faith in a perfect Bible. Number three, no rapture. They, you know, pre-wrath, post-trib, there's all these different things that try to get you to believe that God's going to pour out his wrath on you as his child. Just say, no, I don't think so. Go back to the milk. Okay, the milk of, I'm one of God's children. He's going to redeem me someday as his purchased possession. He's not going to pour out his wrath on me. Chastening, yes. But what happens in the tribulation is not chastening of God's children. It's the punishment of the lost world. Number four, no suffering on earth. You'll get that one. Okay? That's not a teaching of Scripture. And one of the basics that you're going to have to understand as a Christian is you will suffer. And that's how you're rewarded. Number five, no salvation for most people. Limited atonement is what that's called in Calvinism. The blood of Jesus isn't available to everybody, is what they teach. That's heresy. And it's rather stupid as well. Okay? The blood's there. It's up to the people to accept or reject. And if somebody tries to get you messed up in Calvinism, and they will mess you up, if they try to get you messed up in it, just say, no, no thank you. Okay? I know that the Bible teaches that God's love is out there for anybody that wants to accept it, it was manifest at the cross. And if you want to accept that, right there it is. Whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't fall for Calvinism. And number six, no biblical separation. Be very, very careful about the modern apostate and their, their main core doctrine is that you have to be like the world to win the world. Which is interesting. 
because the lost world comes along and they say, what do you have to offer me as a Christian? I'll give you the world. I'll give you the music of the world. I'll give you the movies of the world. I'll give you the dress standards of the world. I'll give you everything that the world offers. And the lost person says, I already have it. See? The lost should be coming to Christians for something different than what they already have. It's just absurd. The Bible teaches separation from the world. And the Bible teaches that if you're a friend of the world, you're the enemy of God. Period. You say, well, maybe we can get into more doctrinal things. No. It's a sincere milk of the word. It's a sincere milk standard. If you're a friend of the world, you're the enemy of God. Simple. Now, any meat that you run into, spiritual meat that you run into, which doesn't line up with the pure milk, you have to reject it. Simple as that. You don't need to go into big debates and big arguments and things. Just say, sorry, I'm established with milk, not with meat. You're not going to try to make my core beliefs your milk or your meat thing. I remember the milk, the, the basics of Christianity. Just as simple as that. And by the way, the heresies are continuing. They're getting worse and worse and worse. More and more people are falling away. Just like the Bible says. Okay? Church age ends in apostasy, not in some kind of a spiritual revival or rebirth or anything. And as you go through the times which are ahead, you're going to have to remember there's milk concepts there the basics of christianity because there's going to be a lot of people that try to get you messed up just the way it is so let's close with a word of prayer and then that'll be it heavenly father i thank you for your word as i say many times lord we would be lost without it uh, there would be people just trying to feel their way to heaven as blind people and they would lead other people into the same ditch as you said, Lord, when you were here on earth. And uh, so I thank you, Lord, for your perfect standard, your perfect book that tells us about salvation, that tells us how we're sealed under the day of redemption, tells us what the future is, tells us what the past is. What an amazing book, Lord, and, and filled with scientific facts. And I just thank you, Lord, for the scriptural analogies of milk and meat. And I pray, Lord, for those that are out there listening and for those that are gathered here this morning, that they would not be established with, with meat, but they would be established with milk, that they would not forget the milk, and that whatever meat, spiritual meat, comes to them, that they would wash it down first with the milk of the Word, the sincere milk of the Word. And so I just uh, ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's going to be it. Thank you so much for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.